Jackie Baldy reports with me as always is my co-host Joe Bitts, who is also a retired combat Marine who was wounded in Iraq. I served three tours in the Middle East in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we've got a great show today. And what we would like to also welcome is our listeners from Heroes Media Group. We always thank you for your support and continued support and hope you like our show. But we've got a great show today. And with us today is we have Jimmy T. Smith, who was a former county commissioner in Citrus County, Florida, and he was also in the state legislature. But most important, he's a retired U.S. Army airborne soldier. So it's always great to have veterans on. Hey, Jimmy, it's great to have you on our show. John, thank you very much. Love uh, listening to you guys talk about all the issues. Great. The one thing I forgot to mention, Jimmy is also the Florida chapter president of Concerned Veterans for America. Now, for our listener standpoint, what is Concerned Veterans for America? Concerned Veterans for America is a national organization that is bipartisan and not for profit. And we are the basic leaders of policy when it comes to veterans. So we don't do service connected disabilities or things like that. We actually deal with Congress directly to make sure that they understand that we need to protect and defend the freedoms and prosperity that our family and us fought for. Now, how is Concerned Veterans for America different from, say, the American Legion, the VFW, and Disabled American Veterans? We're a grassroots organization, so our job isn't to service the veterans on the ground. Our actual job is to connect with the veterans, to find the issues, to drive to D.C. and make the change. As an example, you have the 2019 Mission Act, excuse me, 2018 Mission Act that created the 2019 Community Cares Program. And that was written by us. Okay. Now, what are some of the missions that Concerned Veterans for America are involved in right now? We have three priorities. First is our foreign policy, and that's the policy of realism and restraint, and with the focus right now on ending the endless war in Afghanistan. Our second priority is the veterans getting the care they earned. And of course, that means that we want the full implementation of the Mission Act and the Community Cares Program. And that is something we're currently working on. As we know, we continue to hear stories about veterans not getting the care they deserve. And last but not least is America's prosperity. We're constantly focusing on the VA spending and the DOD spending because we feel that when it comes to those two areas as veterans, which most of our organization is veterans, we have a unique optic on that and can really bring that to the point of discussion for the community. Now, it was interesting prior to this podcast, you had sent me a link and it was a couple of your coworkers having a discussion about these three topics. And one of the things that he mentioned that I thought was really unique in the 20th century, we had two wars and a cold war. Each one was won by the United States. Primarily, our military did a lot to do to end the Cold War, win World War II and World War I. But each one was predicated on our economic success. Our economic is what really transformed and won those wars. How is concerned veterans of America worried about our economic prosperity today? It ties directly into our ability to defend ourselves. So as an example, when you're burdened with debts or related to issues that where we have to worry about what foreign countries will do with our national debt, that really deals deeply with our ability to finance our future military expeditions if we have to defend ourselves. So if we can't get the money to fund building of the tanks or hiring more men and women to serve in service, that directly correlates to a very unsafe nation. So we are very worried about the fact of how our defense is at this point with the potential of the spending being a detriment to our military. The one thing that I saw is if if you listen to President Biden's speech last night, it was more spending, more taxes being raised that hampers our economic security because it's going to hit business. But I heard nothing, and the Republicans are just as egregious as this as well. I heard nothing about reining in our federal deficit and our national debt, which is now close to $30 trillion. And at some point, the rooster is going to come home to roost. It's got to be paid and it's going to impact our economic security. You know, John, even I think it was uh, General Mattis and some others discussed the fact that economics does matter to our national security. But there's areas to where they can focus. So as an example, we overspend and we know we overspend in the VA 
and in the DOD specifically, we overspend. In the last National Defense Authorization Act, they specifically bought more F-35s than the military requested. And it's things like that that is just outrageous and, and we stand against. It's interesting that when you say all that, because Robert Gates, who was the Secretary of Defense under both President George W. Bush and President Obama, he left office, I think, about 2011. And the one thing he said was he was most concerned about he could never rein in the the spending in the Department of Defense. That was his one problem that he wished he could fix. And that was it. And you're right. I came from the Marines. So did Joe. You were in the Army. And here's an example. Both you were in the, you were in the Army. I was in the Marines. Our logistics are different from each service. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the truth is there's no reason for that. And it's this supposed ownership of the supply line. It doesn't have to be a Marine supply line or a Navy or Army or Air Force or, or Space Force. All it has to be is the right products. So we could definitely pull our resources as a military and reduce the cost of that. But it's not just that. If you think about it, we had a increase of revenue come in under the previous President Trump. Correct. And at that same time, we were spending too much. So it's not like uh, America can't develop the long-term prosperity. And that's why that is one of our priorities, because we do know the ability for the American economy to generate the revenue is there. The problem right. is the economy keeps getting pushed down by policy and pushed down by overspending. Well, I think the big problem, we've always had it, but I think the real problem is after the end of the Cold War, we've never articulated what is our national security strategy. We had elements. Each president puts their own one. I think President Trump did his in 2017. And even Anthony Cortison from the Center for Strategic International Studies commented that each branch builds their own strategy around its needs instead of what is the national security need for the country and have the services direct their resources to fulfill their mission to meeting that strategy. John, I would suggest that it goes back to the end of the Cold War. So now we no longer have an enemy. It doesn't allow us to have that key focus on how to defeat an enemy. So buy whatever you want to have all kinds of capabilities instead of being focused on where we need to. And when the war on terror came, it did was increase our ability to spend on low intensity conflict issues instead of high intensity conflict issues. But that didn't really set forward a national strategy to deal with a particular enemy. Now that may change with China and its upcoming or Russia and its current actions. But right now, you're right, we do not have a true focus on our spending to defeat an enemy, and that impacts our long-term security. But even when they were talking about one of your key objectives is to end these endless wars, like in Iraq, Syria, and now Afghanistan, we've been fighting low-intensity counterterrorism operations. We've been fighting a tactical strategy, but we haven't had a strategic strategy. What do we need to do, let's say, in Iraq? It's not all about use the military to defeat ISIS as one. At, that's a tactical strategy. But what's our strategic strategy for that region? And we haven't had one for a number of years. And this crosses both Republican and Democratic administration. And last night, I didn't hear a vision of what President Biden plans to do, except China's doing this. We're going to do this with Russia. We'll be there. That's great. But those are feel good points. That's not a strategy for what we need to do as an America for our national security. And, and you think about it. We were previously in Somalia with U.S. troops and they end up pulling out the majority of U.S. troops. And people gave President Trump a lot of grief about that. But that doesn't mean that we are just dumping on that area and not dealing with it appropriately. We have resources that are more capable now than ever to be in that region, both economically and with intelligence resources, with NGOs, non-governmental operators and stuff like that. So there's lots of ways to do it. So there's no reason that we can't treat Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq the same way we are currently treating operations in Africa. And we have lots of operations in Africa and it's successful. We are doing the right things. Now, the one thing that it's interesting, like what we had said earlier, since the end of the Cold War, we haven't had a national strategy, but it seems like especially after 9-11, everything is military centric. 
And one example during the mid 90s, there was something called the United States Information Agency, and it was eliminated in 1999, and its efforts were folded into a newly created Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. The reason I bring that up is we're not selling our story. Like as an example, in 2002, there was a major earthquake in northwestern Iran, and the public was very critical of the Iranian government because they were slow to respond. They didn't respond. Now, President George W. Bush stated he was going to help the Iranian people. And we did send small military aircraft in with supplies. And his comment was, human suffering knows no political boundaries. And he stood ready to assist the people of Iran as needed and as desired. But fast forward to today, we're just coming out of the coronavirus. Iran signed a major economic deal with China. But do the Iranian people know China was responsible for killing 63,000 Iranians because of the coronavirus? Then you go to Brazil and Mexico, China gave vaccines to these countries and other countries that are barely 50% effective. Are we selling that? Are we telling our story? So not everything has to be the military option first. John, one of the things I served overseas in Panama in the 80s. During the fall of the Berlin Wall, I was over in the tropical paradise of Panama. But I do remember that we were constantly putting out information into the community because Noriega was there at that time. And we wanted to make sure that our armed forces network specifically was being caught by everybody that could watch it. And we would do things in Spanish as well as English. And the thing is that these opportunities of the past have went away. So when we grew up in the military, you had the North Koreans doing radio propagandas and South Korea was doing radio propagandas. You had U.S. had Voice of America over in Europe. And of course, these are, are known to be useful tools, but for some reason, we got away with it. Now, the question is, have they just simply switched over to digital? And right now, I've heard nothing of the United States doing anything overseas digital-wise, but I have heard reports that Russia is currently putting out information that makes us look bad. There was an example of one of the singers, I forget who she is, a rap singer or something, was twerking, and they took the image and they put it on top of a Muslim relic or a Muslim religious item and basically said, hey, look, this is what America thinks of Muslims. We don't think that we're a peace loving country. And this is Russia. And they're telling them that. And here we are, uh, supposedly this great loving nation, and nobody knows it. That's a lot of things. Nobody knows. If you remember during the 2004 tsunami, this was a great example. We went into Indonesia, uh, the largest Muslim country in the world. And unbeknownst to us, the Indonesian people saw all these aircraft flying around and they were all American. And this was a slap in the face to China because China wasn't there. They didn't have the capabilities, but we're not selling it. And if you remember like um, that clip that you let me watch, we won World War II, not because of our military prowess, which was very important, but we won because of our economics. We used all phases of American national power. And Ronald Reagan collapsed the Soviet Union because he didn't just build up the military. He built us up economically. We had this United States Information Agency, which at the time was the largest public relations firm in the world. They were all different people speaking different languages, telling our message. And we're just not doing that. Well, and it's true. And and that is one of those things where we we at CDA have a philosophy of realism and restraint. And part of that restraint is to use other tools. And Correct. we're not. We continue to use the the mallet, okay? Instead of trying to use other tools, we just go in there and use the military mallet as a way for diplomacy instead of connecting with the people. And, and in the military, they, they have the civil affairs, as you well know. They have civil affairs. And it's those kind of things that are important. You have to connect with the people on the ground. And if all we're being seen as in the Middle East is this bad guys and the dictators and religious leaders are pointing out how evil America is, look, they're there, they're these evil Americans, and we have nothing to push back and show what we do in their country, good we do, the projects we do, the billions that we spent, uh, as an example, in, in Afghanistan. We built so many infrastructure projects. Uh, we built bases and, and things like that. Taliban has taken a lot of that over now. 
but nobody knows that we really built it. That's right. part of the problem. We have to, as part of realism and restraint, we have to use all the tools possible. Correct. Now, the last part I want to get to before we start to talk about the the Veterans Administration, I noticed Concerned Veterans for America was is big on changing or ending the authorization for the use of military force. Can you explain what that was? So the authorization for use of military force basically has come out of the history of the presidents using the military. So at some point, the ability for a president to go to war is known. It's in the Constitution, but it's supposed to be a declared war. So at one point, Congress and the, the president came to an agreement, and they developed what's called the Authorization for Use of Military Force. And I think it was a Gulf of Talking that really set this forward. And in that, whenever the president uses force someplace, he has to give notice to Congress, and then he has to ask for the authorization to continue to use those. I believe it's from 90 days or up to 90 days. He has the ability to use them, and then he has to pull them out by that 90-day window. Well, the authorization for use of military force is something other than the declaration of war, which Congress is supposed to do, but it technically gives the ability for a president to keep military forces in a country, or as an example of the 2001 that led us into Afghanistan, it's allowed us to go into 19 different countries 41 times. So that's why we have a major concern about these. And we think it should be scripted down to a time limit. So they should have maybe a couple, two, three years at the most on it. It should be geographic restrictions. So you can't just use this to hop around the entire world to send forces because that's not what we're supposed to do. And then also, when we look at the use of ground forces specifically, because once you put ground forces in, unlike the Navy or the Air Force, once you put ground forces in, it's a whole different thing. And we suggest strongly that there be an additional authorization for use of military force, AUMF, specifically for the use of ground forces. And and that would help, hopefully, keep us from having these endless wars. And here's the biggest thing, though, John, and the reason we stand for that is it's Congress's job to declare war. Congress is the one who actually is supposed to represent their individuals from their districts. And if they're not having that conversation by having open-ended authorization for use of military force, then they're not doing their constitutional duty. Well, so this the, would require it. I think I would agree with you on that. And I think the big reason it's plausible deniability, because after 2002, when they did the authorization to use force to go into Iraq, I'm not trying to slam the Democrats on this, but a lot of Democratic politicians voted for it. That was one of the reasons why Hillary Clinton lost to Barack Obama in 2008. And that was what hindered Joe Biden because they voted for it. So politicians complain about it, but they rather have somebody else make the decision. So it's almost like immigration. Everybody complains about immigration, but immigration is a federal matter that our congressional and Senate leaders aren't doing. And I would agree with you. They need to go back to, we elected you to do the job. Don't punt your responsibility to the executive branch. And that just yeah, and that, needs- right, and that's what they've done, John. They literally have given the free will of the president to use the military as he sees fit with very open-ended and very general AUMS. The, the 2001 is incredibly general. Well, it was kind of ironic and it's disturbing when we went into Libya. That was announced by the Secretary of State while President Obama was overseas, I believe. And I'm not trying to just slam him, but you're right. We've used the authorization to go into Iraq and Afghanistan. We used it in Yemen, Syria, Somalia, the North African countries. And it needs to get back to Congress needs to do its job. Yeah, they actually declared war. There's something that's unique about when you declare war. You're actually putting the entirety of both your military and, like you described earlier, your economy behind the effort. Because there's certain acts that are giving the government the ability to deal with the economy under a state of war that is different than under a UMF. So as an example, we really didn't turn anything in our economy into a war fighting stance to take on Al Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan. That was mostly left to just the military. And you can see how when something like that happens, Yes, we don't want to shut down the whole economy, of course, obviously. But then if it's just the military, then the people at home don't have a major effect. Okay, And if it's a small portion of the military, so few are serving in the first place, then so even less are actually serving in combat zones. People tend to forget it. So we had the forgotten war in Korea 
right now we have forgotten soldiers. And that plays into this next aspect. We talked about the authorization to use force, but let's talk about the VA and what you've mentioned. When I got back from Afghanistan in 2012, I was a reservist. I went home to Sacramento. I didn't run into anybody. Everybody goes, thank you for your service, but they didn't have anybody serve. They didn't have any kids serve. So where do you see some of the challenges the VA is facing right now? So, you know, what you're describing is really important because as things are starting to develop where we're aware more and more that there are challenges within the VA, we're, we're looking at the potential for a whole nother VA scandal like they had in 2014. And part of the challenge is people say, oh, yes, we support our veterans. But if you don't have real true buy-in, like a son or daughter, grandson, granddaughter, then do you really want to get up and spend your free time or take a day off for work to go to a congressman's office to protest to make sure that veterans are getting the care they need or that the VA is held accountable, in which we know from the fact of the 2014 VA scandal and subsequently, nobody's ever held accountable. And I say nobody, there may have been a few here or there, but in general, people are not accountable in the VA healthcare system, be it monetary or healthcare. For just for a really quick snippet. What was the VA scandal in 2014, just for our listeners who are maybe forgotten or unaware of what happened? What was that? So in 2014 in Phoenix, there was a system put in place in which the VA was basically hiding patients. They were not getting the patients, the appointments that they were supposed to get. So as an example, if you have cancer, if you have heart issues, if you have other life-threatening issues and you're not getting the care you earned, you potentially will die from that. And they went back and researched and they found that hundreds of servicemen and women potentially died from not getting the care in the VA in Phoenix. And that led to, of course, a lot of congressional, a lot of news reports and things like that. So we found that it was basically the veterans were going to the VA, the veterans were not getting the care. Their appointments were either not being made or being canceled. They didn't know about it. And then subsequently, there was no follow-up, and veterans were dying because of this. So, Jimmy, have you seen a change from since 2014 when the scandal kicked off to when the Trump administration kicked in and then back? Because from my perspective, in short, I never had a bad experience at the VA, but I'm just one person out of the many. What did you notice? Joe, as, as somebody who's been in uh, the world of politics and also being a veteran, when I was at the Florida House, I was very much involved in the issues of veterans affairs. So I've had my fingers on the pulse for this. So in 2000 and 14, when that happened, that drove a lot of debate on Capitol Hill. And you had bipartisan discussion on how to fix these things. And they started passing resolution or laws to eventually get to the point to where they had the Mission Act. So in 2018, the Mission Act came out, created a law that created a program that in 2019 started, and it was called the Community Cares Program. And I got to tell you, the Community Cares Program allowed veterans to go outside of the VA for care. So the times were a little different then because there's been some changes. But at that time, if you had, I think, 28 days and had to spend like an hour to travel, then you could go outside the VA. So the VA in a rural area would tell you that you had to go get some kind of screening, but it was many days away or too far to drive. You could just go to the local doctor. It's been changed and our current laws basically say if you are 20 days away from your requested uh, appointment date or more than a 30-minute drive, you can request, actually, you're supposed to be notified that you have the option for the community cares program. So it started to get better. Then before COVID hit, we started to notice an issue, pension exams and other things like that. The backlogs were starting to build. And then once COVID hit, then we noticed a big issue. And we and several congressional leaders wrote a letter to Vilsack, the then secretary of the VA, and President Trump and say, hey, look, we have some serious concerns that you're not adhering to the law that says the Mission Act and the Community Cares Program. And if you don't follow that law, basically, we're going to have troops not getting the care they earned. And so here we are now, over a year now since the COVID hit, and the secretary of the VA specifically said in testimony that the VA has over a 19.7 canceled, delayed, or moved appointments, okay? Mm -hmm. During a specific time, and that's from March to May of last year, during that time frame, there was 7.3 million 
uh, was canceled, delayed, or moved. And of those in that time frame, 2.3 million did not have follow-up calls. And because they did not have follow-up calls, those people did not get the care. And I'll tell you, I spoke to somebody in Jacksonville just the other day. And what they told me is that they had cancer. They were a cancer survivor and that they were supposed to get their three-year checkup last year. Okay. So every three years, cancer survivor, go back and get your checkup. They canceled his appointment. They never followed up. And he's made phone calls to them and they've not responded to his phone calls. So here's a cancer survivor that if cancer has returned, does not know it because he has not gotten his appointments. Wow. So now what's the current policy of the Biden administration now that the new VA secretary, Dennis McDonough, if I pronounce his name, and he was the chief of staff for President Obama when that whole VA scandal broke. So what's his approach to some of the challenges that veterans are facing? Well, so far in the congressional testimony, they talked about the need for $20 billion more billion to go into the VA healthcare system. They also talked about expanding the services that the VA provides, which is contrary to the concept of what really needs to happen. There's no need for the VA to expand services. So if you think about it, the VA was created because there was a lack of services in the community back in the day. Very few doctors and things like that, not enough to really provide service. Now there's an abundance. Our civilian medical industry has the ability to handle it. There's no reason to expand services in the VA. And the VA budget, as projected in President Biden's budget, is expected to grow an additional 8.7%. And so that's concerning because they're asking to do more. They're asking for more money. And yet still, we know that They're fiscally not responsible, and we do have servicemen and women who are not getting the care they earn. That's a good point. It just seems like with government, something's broke, so we throw more money at it. And if the VA can't handle what it's currently doing... What makes you think they're going to be able to handle when you expand or get into other areas of care? That just doesn't make sense. And that's the reason that the CBA really fights the ground fight. So here's the problem. It goes back to what we spoke about earlier. Not enough people know about this right now. You have uh, Walt Buteau from WFLA Channel 8 in Tampa, who has done some really good articles and done a couple of media pieces and stuff like that. He's talking about it. We're out there talking about it. But in general, the whole United States is worried about other things, not well, worried think, about this. I think the reason is it goes back to what we had said earlier and what I had went through. I remember coming back from Iraq in 2005. I got back in about October. Well, November, my brother comes down with his wife. We go to Thanksgiving at his wife's sister's in-law's house, if that makes sense. While we were there, the mother asked me, so are you coming down just to visit your brother? And he goes, no, I'm stationed over at Camp Pendleton. I just got back from Iraq a couple weeks ago. And I thought her head was going to explode because she never met anybody that served in the military, especially somebody that served in Iraq. And this is already two years since we went into Iraq. We're lucky that we live close to McDill. So there's a lot of veterans that we run into. Many regions of the country is hard pressed to find a veteran. It's almost like that mutual Vomaha commercial where you tag you on the ear says that's what a veteran looks like in his natural habitat. (laughs) If you're not associated with the veteran that you don't have relatives or family member close to you, it doesn't matter. It's a dilemma because the world really is at a state of peace better than we've ever been. It doesn't seem like it, but the studies show that we are. But there's not a whole bunch of real awareness of it. And we, as described earlier, we don't have that unified enemy, although it seems like China is trying to be. But we don't have that unified enemy where the nation as a whole, if you remember when we were kids, everybody was worried about the Russians and the Ruskies and whatever derogatory term you wrote, you used for them. And we had that. We don't have that right now. Everybody, uh, they're more worried about who's doing what on on what stage and or who's kneeling in a sport or things like that. They're not worried about the fact that we have men and women serving in dangerous but, situations overseas. But Jimmy, here's a point. When I joined the Marines in 1982, the World War II generation, when they came out of the war from 1946 to 1982, every phase of American society had a veteran. When I went to Afghanistan in 2012, When I got home and went back into the civilian society, many businesses had no veterans. They don't understand what you do. And from our political leadership, this is interesting. Every war from the revolution 
to World War II, there was a president who fought in that conflict, served as president. We have never had a Korean War veteran. We've never had a Vietnam veteran president. And we'll see if we get the war on terror, if we'll ever have a veteran who served in the war on terror become president. And that well, goes to Congress. Congress is less than 20 percent who's actually served their country. I think you're going to see a, a slight uptick. And the reason I say that is men and women serve in the military and they usually between the age, of course, 18 to averages the 40s. People don't really get involved in, in politics until their 30s and 40s on average. That is usually yeah, when people right. become more more aware. So I think you're going to start seeing that. You're seeing it more in the state houses where veterans are getting more engaged in the state houses. And and hopefully that will lead to it. I don't think we're going to ever have the numbers like we did post-World War II. No, that's because the numbers were far greater then. Right. But there is a potential for us to see a, a couple of presidential candidates in the near future who have served in the military. But then you go to the other institutions like the media, the law. These individuals, men and women, have not served. So The media asks questions. They should be the investigators, especially when it comes to the running up of the defense budget. But they don't know what questions to ask because they have a very rudimentary knowledge or it goes back to the Vietnam era type stuff. They just don't know what to ask. One of the things that Florida did in the past is we really push hard on entrepreneurship for veterans. Correct. And and if you look at the nation as a whole, Small mom-pop businesses, about 10% of them are veteran-owned, okay? So you have 1% serving right now. 10% of mom-pop businesses are veterans-owned. And we have strong organizations in the state of Florida working on that, from Veterans Florida to FAVOP to other organizations that are doing veteran entrepreneurship. And the hope is that they'll drive a strong economy with the values that veterans can bring to the table. But there's really not that effort in the world of leadership in politics, because I have to tell you, there's a lot of veterans right now, because of the endless wars, I would subject you to that thought, that are saying, you know what, I don't trust my government, I don't want to be part of it. And my thing is, is that if you don't trust the government, don't want to be part of it, that's the reason being in it, is to make sure it goes in the right directions. And if anybody I knows how agree. to turn things around, it's the veterans. Uh, so Jimmy, I want to touch on what you were just talking about. So here in Florida, it's called Veterans Florida. And what they do is they offer $8,000 to a business that hires veterans. USAA is down here, and they're using the whole $1 million because they're the only ones applying for it. Now, are you aware or are you guys working on something where we can get more entrepreneurs out of military members or also giving businesses money to hire veterans? Because John and I strongly believe that veterans are what drive America because they've seen the worst and they come back from it and then they carry that with them. But they also have that discipline instilled in them and it just creates a better drive for a person. One of the things the Concerned Veterans for America does not do that. Okay, we need to do some educational things on mental health, on finances and things through our foundation. But when it comes to the policy side, we stay within a small amount of bandwidth. We know that different departments and agencies or not-for-profits can do many different things. We stay strictly to those three priorities that we have because we know that with nobody else really focused in that main factors, if we lose focus on it, we lose effectiveness and we don't want to do that. So we don't do veteran service things. We don't do job hiring things. Now we will work with, as an example, we worked with leaders in Tallahassee this session, and there was a bill that was ran that would allow for a mom and pop business to be run in a residential area, okay, small business. And we supported that because it was an occupational licensing policy that basically opened up and broke barriers for veterans and opened up opportunities. Things like that, we will go and speak on behalf of, but we won't lead it. It's not going to be our policy. We just will be supportive of it. Do you get involved with the business community when it talks about leadership and the value? Because I wrote a book about it called The New Business Brigade. Why? And it was mainly focused on business. Why businesses need to look at the values that the military brings. We're innovative. Now, as an example, in the book, I had somebody who was a corporate trainer. She said something was disturbing or at least troubling. She thought I was enlisted, just like Joe. 
And she thought most enlisted didn't have high school diploma. And then when I said, you can't join the military unless you have a high school diploma. And then she mentioned, they probably have a hard time reading. You can't be in the military unless you read. Because the, as the military is very technical. Even in the infantry, everything is digital. And Absolutely. To say, and to say stuff like that, it's just amazing. Like the CEO of FedEx, uh, Fred Smith. He based a lot of his things from his combat service as a Marine combat officer in Vietnam. But we don't have that many business leaders or national leaders outside of politics, like in the media and all these other areas who really understand the military community. So one of the things that we are doing, and this is on the military side to dispel that issue. So we we are not currently working with them specifically about that because there's already the Veterans Florida and FAVOP and others. But down in Tampa, we're going to be doing a veterans transition program. And the goal on this is to deal with the veteran, not on how to write a resume or, or something like that, but how to be a civilian. Because a lot of times the veterans come out and, and they have the challenge. I'll give you a story that was relayed to me. There was a lieutenant colonel that was going into this business, was recommended by an organization. The business had been in business for decades, right? Very successful business. They had this plan of action that they want to take and they presented it to Lieutenant Colonel because here's a new guy. What do you think, new guy? And he said, this is this sucks. This is horrible. You shouldn't do this. And they went back to the person that had recommended him and they're like, hey, we don't want this guy. We've been running this business for decades and he's going to come in here and tell us our business sucks. That blatant truthful aspect of the military is good. To a degree, yes. To a degree, Okay. Part of that is the the reality of how to engage civilians. It is uniquely different because in the military, that would have been questions. Okay, when you say it sucks, why does it suck? And how can we make it better? Where's your concerns? The civilian sector does not think in that same fashion. And they'll look at it and they may be offended by it. And that harsh truth or, or that brutal fact of reality is something that we want to discuss with veterans as they're coming out. So we're going to do a transition program and we're going to talk about how to be a civilian. And it's not as easy well, as people think it is. No, that's important because if you only did four years, it may be a little bit easier because you're not that far removed from civilian life. But if you're a senior enlisted or a senior level officer, it's far different. It is different. I know a lot of senior enlisted Marines that just had very difficult time because they were so regimented in that. And you've got to have some kind of diversity in your background. But I, the one thing that I just gets my blood boiling is every time you turn on the TV, they look at veterans and all veterans have either PTSD or were, were emotionally or physically broke. And I'd like, I would love to dispel that rumor where all don't have PTSD just because we served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, but John, it is up to the veteran to exhibit that. So as an example, I am that guy who joined the military by dropping out of high school. So I'm one of those unique ones back in the day that was allowed. But when I got out of the military, I had a while in the military. I was at uh, my last duty station and befriended a Vietnam veteran who talked about being a civilian and his experiences coming home. So when I got out, I knew to get involved with a civic organization because Mm -hmm. I want to build connections in the community. And I knew to never dress down. So I would be on the work site doing construction, digging a ditch. And I would have a t-shirt on and a polo, sweat my butt off in the middle of the Florida sun. But somebody who would come up on that work site would stop, look around, and they'd come over to me digging a ditch. And I go, no, I'm not charged. Those guys are. But they had the ratty t-shirts on and stuff like that. But right away, I gave the image that I was in charge. When I did pest control, I studied everything about all the products I was using. And I would articulate it just like you would be doing in a common task training in in a unit. I would articulate the things that I was doing and why and the long-term effect. I had people ask me what my degree was in. And that's the thing. We have to teach the the military mindset. When you come out, those unique skills that you have, like giving a class or, or participatory actions or setting the example by your appearance, which is very big in the military, carries out very well in the civilian sector. But a lot of times people come out and they're like, I don't have to wear a uniform anymore. I don't have to shave anymore. Who cares? I did my time. That attitude hurts. No, it does. And that for me, I had the, I can see both sides of it. I had an opposite approach when I got back from Iraq. I love politics. Joe can probably tell you that's all he talks about. I love public policy. So when I got back from Iraq, I sent press releases out to a lot of the 
conservative radio stations because I used to work at a political consulting firm. They talked to me like I was a two-year-old. Until I started to speak, and then they realized it became an oh crap moment. This guy knows something, and they tried to swing it back. And I had friends who listened to, it and they're like, "You should have been doing the radio show more than they do." But that's the reason I I always read about history, politics, economics. So I am when I get in those situations, they don't just look at me. Oh, he's just enlisted. And then once I start to speak. They're like, okay, this guy knows something. And, and that's the thing, John. You have to demonstrate your skills and abilities that you learn in the military. And don't be afraid to maintain those skills in the no, civilian I agree. sector. Now, for the final question is, what are some of the things that you're working on now that you're the Florida chapter? Or are you doing things on a national level? Or are you just sticking on the state level? So we're a grassroots organization. So my effort is to continue to get the message out from you know, having conversations with people like you and Of course, I do the radio. I do three radio shows a week on average and various blogs and stuff like that. I do articles. There should be an editorial either tomorrow or the next day in the Tampa Bay Times. And the goal here is to drive the grassroots. So we have a national organization. And unlike everything we've ever learned about the military, they actually want the privates to run things. So you want the young men and women on the ground. So we have an engagement director in Tampa, and he does original work. And he's doing the transition program. We have an engagement director in Jacksonville, and she is out there just just doing incredible things in Jacksonville. In Pensacola, we have our engagement director out there, and she's meeting with all the players and making things happen and, and creating volunteers. And we're taking all that effort. And that's where we got the information about the VA scandal that's brewing okay. in Bay Pines. So we take and we work the ground, we find the issues, and we drive that up to the top. And then the top develops a plan of action on how to connect with the congressional leaders. So we are a bottom up grassroots organization, but our priorities are right now the endless war, but it is growing more and more to where we are going to be in a big effort in trying to deal with the VA because veterans lives depending on what we do. Now, for our listener standpoint, how can our listeners find out more about Concerned Veterans for America? Of course, we have the obvious website, which is cv4a.org, and that's Charlie Victor, the number four, alpha.org. They can check us out at Concerned Vets on Twitter. They can check us out also on Concerned Veterans on Facebook. And of course, if they have any VA stories, both good and bad, because we all know the, the good stuff and the bad stuff, they can also go to, and this is all one word, myvastory.org. And basically helps share the message of their challenges with the VA. And because that's how grassroots work. We get the stories from the people and we make a difference. First of all, I'd like to thank Jimmy T. Smith for being on our show. He's the Florida chapter president of Concerned Veterans for America. So we thank you for coming on. We also like to put a thanks to our listeners from Heroes Media Group. Keep following us. We try to have engaging conversations with movers and shakers like Jimmy T. And it's a pleasure having you on. And also, we're in the process of live streaming these podcasts. We tried it before. We just got some bugs to work out. So we're going to get those fixed. Now, Joe, why don't you tell them what we're also doing? So close to the end of the month, hopefully before May, we're going to get a Patreon going for everybody that want to support the show and they can donate as little as a dollar. And for that, we're going to give you an extra show along with other things that the more you donate, the more you get maybe even uh, all the way from advertising to a yearly membership to the Patreon. And that will be coming out and we'll be sending links for that out once it's up and running and until then everybody have a good yeah and thanks for listening to ubaldi reports until next time keep listening